Today I'm going to talk about boxes. Not the kind that pile up on my porch from Amazon, and not the kind that presents come in, wrapped up in pretty paper and bows. I'm going to talk about a set of boxes that were created to describe and define us, and how my relationship with those boxes has changed over the years. These are the race and ethnicity forms that we find on things like applications for employment, mortgages and loans, our insurance and healthcare records, the national census and other surveys we get, and our public ed education profiles. They're intended for us to report our race and ethnicity, but for some of us, I think they can be more. These boxes can be a way to declare who we are and even share our stories, like I'm going to do today. The last few decades, the forms have looked a lot like this. But over time, and in particularly in recent years, there have been changes to what is collected, allowing us to talk about region of origin and cultural affiliation. But in the end, when, these, when the data is reported by most agencies, institutions, and programs, all the responses are distilled down to something this simple. And for some of you, creating this form may not seem like a big deal. It might seem easy. No dissonance, no angst, no consternation, but that's not the case for all of us. While there are many examples of the, the ways these forms can challenge us, the federal and state requests to complete both questions is something I've heard colleagues, friends, and the students that I work with describe as very frustrating. Question one is not so hard, but question two is difficult because folks who identify as Latino or Hispanic don't see themselves in the response options. When working with some students on how we might resolve this, I came across this definition of American Indian or Alaska Native on a federal form. A person having origins in any of the original peoples of North and South America, including Central America, and who maintains tribal affiliation or community attachment. That first part, that hit as well. We all felt like we were from the original peoples of the Americas. That seemed right. But the second part was disconcerting to the students and infuriating to me. And who maintains tribal affiliation or community attachment? For centuries, there's been intentional destruction of communities to disrupt the cultural affiliation of indigenous people across the Americas. For my family, the epitome of how our culture and communities were destroyed is forced migration, the Trail of Tears. 100 years before my mother was born, her great-great-grandfather, Walter A. Dare, was marched from northern Georgia to Indian Territory. On the Trail of Tears, he was witness to family separation, disease, starvation, death, and new life. Yes, babies were born and died on the March West. For him, the trail ended in northeastern Oklahoma, where he set about farming and creating a permanent home for his family. But by the time my mother was born in 1934, the family had been forcibly removed a second time. Because as railroads expanded in the west, the land that they had been given on the Cowskin Prairie was viewed as too valuable for Indians. So many Cherokee people were pushed south. Our family was eventually allotted titled land in the Cherokee Nation that we called the home place. And generations of our family farmed and tended a small orchard there. Other family members were allotted land in the county, and I remember when we visited our grandfather, he would drive us around, proudly having us meet the kinfolks. And this is a photo of my big sister and I, the last time we were able to visit our grandparents at the home place. I think we're really fortunate that this part of my family's story is preserved in a 1937 Public Works Administration interview with my great-grandfather, Isaac Batt. Batt is a Cherokee way of saying Adair. It's hard to read. It's a tragic and painful story, but it's typical of the indigenous people of North America and South America who have endured, who have endured many forced migrations, kidnapping, enslavement, assimilation, boarding schools, deportation, segregation, and inequitable incarceration. All of these things were done with the intent to destroy our communities and disrupt our cultures. So you might think the easiest thing to do is just skip the question, but then there's this. 
In the instance of missing information, your employing agency will attempt to identify you based identify your race and ethnicity based on your appearance. So if you opt out, someone else might identify you um, for those forms. I've seen this happen here when I was on a search committee, and I absolutely refused to do it, regardless of institutional guidelines. I don't appreciate being misidentified, and I'm absolutely not going to risk doing it for someone else. And despite knowing that it happens all the time, I would really love to see what some employing agency would come up for me, come up with for me based on the way that I look. Starting when I was young, I often felt that people didn't think I was white, but they didn't know what I was. Sometimes it was as simple as a question as, what are you? And other times, where's your family from? And other times, it was simply just a really clear case of mistaken identification. When I started fourth grade at a new school in Louisiana, I was cornered in the girls' bathroom and taunted for being a four-eyed Chinese. I didn't care about wearing glasses, but I wanted to clear up that I was not Chinese, like our classmate Helen, and I was proud to be Cherokee. So I stood up tall and not so gently explained to the girls that my family was Indian. We were Cherokees from Oklahoma. The bell rang, the small crowd dispersed, and I thought that was going to be the end of that. But no, over the next few days, this is how I was greeted in the hallways. How? And the occasional war cry or tomahawk chop. I suppose it was the only way that Southern elementary school kids knew how to be Indian. And while I found it incredibly uncomfortable, I didn't push back because I didn't really know how to be Indian either. Like most Native Americans in our country, we had not been raised in a community of Native people. What I knew about being Indian came from what I saw on TV, the books we read in school, and limited time I got to spend with my cousins. That fourth grade combination of confidence and confusion, sorry, continued into my teens. When I was in high school, and I was old enough to be the one completing the registration forms, there was only one box. You had to choose one identity. I was proud to be Cherokee, so that's what I checked. But I also worried a lot about whether I was Indian enough, especially after we moved to Oklahoma. I also wondered, what would my mom have selected for me, and would that have been different from what my dad would have picked? I also thought about all my sisters, my cousins, my aunts, for sure, we were all Native and we were white, but we didn't talk about things like that. And we certainly didn't talk about how they made us feel. I also remember later when we had the opportunity to select multiracial. That was easy to embrace. It was easier. I never thought about whether I, was, whether I fit that identity enough. I didn't have doubts. But then, the next challenge for me was when we got the directions to check all that apply and there was no multiracial. It really felt funny to first check that American Indian box and then go down and check the box by white because I had never thought of myself as white. Even though I absolutely recognized that at least half of my ancestry was white, I had always considered myself Native American. And it was really hard to let go of that singular identity, no matter how many times it had been and would be questioned or doubted. One of the times my identity was questioned really sticks with me because I think it showcases and reminds me of what a wonderful combination I am of my parents. Those are my parents in 1962, just after they were married. Early in my career, I was doing some work with um, Lapway High School on the Nez Perce Reservation in Idaho. <clears throat> During introductions at our first meeting, I sensed some skepticism as I introduced myself even a little side-eye from one guy as I talked about being Cherokee. Later, I made it a point to engage with him. We had a great conversation about my work and my background, and we even found that he knew one of my mom's friends from college that lived in Lapway. As I was leaving, he smiled, told me to come over to him, and he said, you know, you're the tallest, most blue-eyed Indian I've ever met. While I was kind of taken aback, I was also relieved and pleased because I knew I had passed his test. And while that was important to the work I was going to be doing, it was more important to me and who I was. 
Now, almost 30 years later, I can comfortably and confidently acknowledge that I am both white and an enrolled citizen of the Cherokee Nation of Oklahoma. I know that I come from the colonized and the colonizers. From the original people of this land and those who came here to steal land and resources for far off empires. So each time I'm presented with the opportunity to identify who I am, whether on a form, in person, or on Zoom, I take time to think about and recognize that complex past, honoring my ancestors, my mom and dad, and the future for my beautiful daughter. These identities, native and white, are at the core of me, and they impact how I show up as a leader. In everything I do, my intention is to represent the people who are not at the table with me, to be the voice and the advocate for the underrepresented, and to acknowledge the privileges of those who are frankly overrepresented. As the higher education administrator, I've been part of making decisions that were important not only in the moment that we made them, but for the future of the students that we serve. How we spend money and allocate resources, the policies that we create and perpetuate, the practices we allow, the people we hire, who we welcome in, and who we let go. I declare who I am by checking these simple boxes, and I feel responsible for the people that they represent. How all of this plays out in the work that I do, and the way that I do the work, can be summed up on this ring that I'm wearing. It was given to me by a dear friend when I was appointed to be Vice President of the Division of Enrollment and Access here at CSU in 2018. On the outside, it is inscribed with speak truth to power. On the inside, it says fear or love. Speaking truth to power and leading with love over fear has never been more salient to me when there, than when there was a racist incident on our campus just weeks after I got the job. Two young Native men who were touring campus were targeted by a mom in the group who thought that they looked like they didn't belong here and she was worried because they didn't answer her questions to her satisfaction. So she called 911, campus police responded, and the incident became a national flashpoint for Native people. Because it was an admissions tour in the division I ran, I was viewed as the person most responsible for what had happened. I was new to the job, I was Native like the young men, and I was white like the woman who had made the call. It felt like all of my identities were swirling and being pulled and pushed, and it was a really tough time. In the days and weeks that followed, though, I learned what it meant and what it took to speak truth to power, whether it was to the chief of police or the university president. I also learned how to speak truly out of love over fear when taking responsibility for the pain and harm created on our campus. I found power in who I was and I used my voice to speak, to speak truth out of love, especially when the voices of Native leaders and elders were being talked over and pushed aside again and again. So back to those forms and boxes that I first described as simply a way to identify our race and ethnicity. It's really not simple at all. And for me, it's not just checking the boxes for a job a loan or insurance. It's identifying who I am and how I am going to show up as a citizen, an employee, a customer. A Native American woman who honors who she is, the result of the colonized and the colonizers, walking confidently through this world for her ancestors and for the future and for how I want to be remembered. So for all of you, I hope you too will think beyond just checking the boxes and interrogate where you've come from and how you want to show up in your world. Because your actions today will determine what kind of ancestor you will be remembered as. Thank you.